Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Joanne Baumgartner with Wild Farm Alliance, and welcome to the, our third All Things Avian Virtual Field Day. Today, it's at Davis Ranches, and we're really excited about the lineup and what you're going to learn today. Um, and I want to thank all of our sponsors. Um, especially Department of Pesticide Regulations, part of California, uh, state of California, um, and, uh, and others. Uh, and um, our mission is to promote a healthy, viable agriculture that protects and restores wild nature. So there's a few housekeeping things I wanted to go over. Everyone's muted, so please put your questions in the chat box, and after each speaker, we'll have a short Q&A session. If you have technical difficulties, you can put a comment in the chat box and Shelly um, will respond, uh, Shelly, who uh, I work with, and or, um, uh, or email her uh, at that, this email address you can see, and we're recording this session and we'll send a link a few weeks. So if you can't um, uh, listen to all of it today, you can always go back and we're going to be splitting up the talks by speaker. So it'll be easy to find what you might have missed. Um, but please stay with us the whole time. And if you do and you're able to fill out a short evaluation, you'll be entered in a raffle for a long sleeve Western snap shirt uh, by Patagonia. So our agenda today, uh, first we're gonna he hear from Emily Reinhardt at Davis Ranches. Um, and then next, Rachel Long, Farm Advisor, Interim County Director, UC Cooperative Extension. And then Sasha Heath, Living Earth Collaborative Fellow at Washington University in St. Louis. Then Kara Strum, Conservation Pro Project Manager at Audubon, California. And lastly, Megan Garfinkel, Research Associate at University of Illinois, Chicago. Um, we will be sharing resources and uh, doing that evaluation after that. Um, and as I said, there's going to be questions after each speaker. The first thing we are going to share is a, a short video that we put together with Emily and Rachel. And I am going to hand this off now to Shelly Con Connor. All right. Um, I'm just going to play the video now. This is a video that we created with um, both Emily and Rachel, who you'll hear from hear from later today. Um, and it gives you a really good um, idea about Davis ranches and seeing some beautiful images from the ranch as well. So without further ado. I like working on projects that are a win-win for farmers and also for the environment. So for example, planting hedgerows uh, around field crops brings in a lot of birds. Those birds do help out with pest control in the adjacent crops and birds have a place to live and farmers get pest control services for free. I think what surprises me the most is how just a little bit of habitat can make a really big difference. Birds need a place to forage, they need a place to nest, and providing that habitat on field edges brings in a lot of birds, insectivorous birds in particular, that do move into the adjacent crops and, uh, and help out with uh, pest control. We decided to do restoration along the historic Sycamore Slough, connecting the river riparian all the way to the Calusa Refuge. And so it's about a five and a half to seven and a half mile stretch, depending on how you connect our hedgerows. We thought that it would be important to be able to provide safe passage and connectivity to these great resources and natural habitat. And um, by providing a corridor through our ranch, we actually would allow the wildlife to get out onto our landscape and then find safe refuge as they travel between the two. So the birds that we are providing habitat for on our hedgerows are foraging in our fields and our orchards for pests. So your navel orange worms or your coddling moth or invasive insects that are, you know, damaging our crops. And by providing habitat for birds, they're actually out there 
as a natural pest management, which we're excited about. It's reducing our dependency on chemicals. It's another tool in our toolbox that both looks beautiful and you feel good about. Steps a farmer should take is identifying a manageable sized project. What are your long-term goals? What can you accomplish now? And then what are those incremental steps to get to your end goal? First, it's important to become familiar with the birds on your farm and to know which birds are beneficial and which birds are pests and when they're pests and when they're beneficial. Second, it's important to plant a diversity of habitat around farms. For example, putting in trees and shrubs that provide habitat for a diversity of birds. And third, it's important to put up nest boxes and uh, raptor perches to bring in uh, raptors like uh, barn owls to help control uh, different pests because every one pest that they take is one less that you have to worry about on your farm. Uh, bird numbers are decreasing and, and we're losing a, yeah, a really valuable pest control ally. And so it is important to put habitat on farms to bring in these birds to provide better pest control and adjacent crops. The number, the sheer number of birds accessing the habitat has been my favorite thing to see. All right. Um, so with that, I'm going to um, stop sharing and hand it over to Emily, and she's going to tell us a little bit more about Davis Ranches. Okay. See if we can do this. <laughs> um, oops. Hang on just a second. Thank you. Okay, good. So, just want to make sure I could see everyone here. <laughs> All right. Um, well, welcome everybody. I'm uh, Emily Reinhardt, and I am the business manager at Davis Ranches here in uh, Calusa County. I started working for the family in 2010 as the project manager, and my first project was to help work on restoration. Hey, and Emily. Uh, Oh, I'm yes. sorry to interrupt, um, but that's okay. did you mean to share your screen? Oh, I did. <laughs> okay, we, we don't see it. Let me try that again. Okay. Um, there you um, go. Now. Okay, cool. Perfect. Great. <laughs> Thanks for catching that. Um, so Emily Reinhardt again. Hi, everybody. Um, I am the business manager today, and it's been 11 years of working at Davis Ranches, which has been really fun to see the progress. And I'm going to kick you off since we're not here on site. I'm going to help orient you here at the ranch. So this is a map of the Sacramento Valley and it shows all the rice country and Davis Ranches is located about six miles south of Calusa between the Sacramento River and the Calusa Wildlife Refuge. Originally it was 8,000 acres and was established by Howell Davis in 1857. He started farming wheat and he ran cattle on the property and rice didn't come into production until 1919 on the property. And it is still farmed, that same acreage is still farmed by the great, great grandson of one of our first tenants, which is pretty great. In 1888, the, our patriarch Hal Davis passed away and his wife, Sabaya Davis, ended up running the ranch. And since then, the ranch has been successfully led by women, which is also very cool. Here's the family today. So the ranch is still owned by the same family. We are on our sixth and seventh generation of families. And we lease out most of our property, but we do farm some stuff in, in house. There are about 30 owners and they live all over the United States and overseas. The farm is run by a board of trustees who meet monthly. And all the members get together once a year for a big annual meeting. So these are some photos from previous annual meetings. Uh, we try and organize a farm tour to help educate them on the local and industry issues that we are working through. In 2009, the ownership was reorganized. Uh, some of the family was ready to be done. 
And so the remaining owners sold off peripheral pieces to local farmers in the area. So we still maintain the 8,000 acres as our water district and we operate together. Um, but Davis Ranches now just owns the core piece. It's about 5,300 acres. And here's a typical crop map. So you can see that we have quite a lot of rice, which is where we started working with the birds. Um, but we also have row crop ground and about 200 acres of walnut. Added a little rice fact in there that we produce just on the property that Davis Ranches manages, uh, about 21 and a half million ton or pounds of milled rice every year, which is enough to feed everybody 26 pounds, which is the average US consum consumed number, um, everyone in San Francisco or the entire state of South Dakota. Um, okay, so the Davis family uh, really wants to maintain their heritage, they have a really strong connection with the land and they want to be farming in the year 2100. So in working with the family, we have developed their kind of goals that they see making this possible. So they believe that by implementing sustainable farm practices, working collaboratively on conservation and integration on working land, that we can achieve farming in 2021 by by increasing public outreach, um, being involved in our community and striving to provide educational opportunities to learn about agriculture and conservation. So how did we start this? <laughs> we started restoring one acre in 2009. Um, and since then we've built a network of 34 different partners. They include private and public organizations, other farmers and um, NGOs. They've, they are helping shape our long-term goal of farming into the year 2100. Each partnership had, and project has shown us the power of incremental success. So here's a list of all of the projects that have been done in the last decade. Um, many of them are ongoing. Obviously there's too many to talk about today, so I'm just gonna focus on a few, uh, but there is additional information at the end of the presentation and Shelly will be providing this to you guys uh, should you want more information, there's also some helpful links. But these are the programs that I'm going to just touch on today. So we will start with our carbon farm plan. This was finished in 2019 with um, our partners at the Calusa County Resource Conservation District as our lead. Um, it's the first plan that's been written in Calusa County, and it included a full survey of our operations to date. It documented what we've been doing well and where we can improve. There's a myriad of projects that have been identified that will help us increase our carbon sequestration and reduce our farming footprint, which is really interesting to see. Um, some of the practices that were called out were all of our conservation efforts, so permanent habitat and cover cropping, along with composting actually gets us the most carbon sequestration so far. Um, our next project is our Healthy Soils Demonstration Site. This is also facilitated by Calusa County Resource Conservation District in partnership with the UC Extension. Um, we received a grant from the Healthy Soils Program and we're working with our tenant farmer, Richter Ag, to test different cover crop mixes within a conventional system. I've included a link, there's a couple videos that talks specifically about this project, but the RCD has been doing a fantastic job um, putting together virtual field days so you guys can learn about health, healthy soil. Our next project is with um, the Community Alliance of Family Farmers. We are doing a cover crop trial in Walnut. This is one of our younger orchards, and it's looking at increasing soil health over three years. Um, so we are looking at nitrogen, carbon, soil organic matter, potassium, and phosphorus. And we're hoping that the results kind of help us fine tune our farming of our walnuts. Um, we're hopefully going to be integrating some habitat studies there as well. Um, but overall, we're really excited that it's definitely improving the soil quality year to year. Our first bird project is working with the Migratory Bird Partnership, um, specifically on our rice ground. 
and we have also participated in bird returns. We started working with Point Blue, Audubon, California, and the Nature Conservancy on the best management practices in rice fields. So we are looking at seasonal habitat, um, post-harvest, and how we can do um, better things in the fields after we harvest instead of um, just disking and leaving it fallow. Uh, we've, just, we've helped develop best management practices there, and we can provide a lot of habitat along the Pacific Flyway each year. Kara might talk about this a little bit, I'm not quite sure, but um, she's on the call today too. So in order to bring people out to the ranch to see what we are doing, we establish a, our first annual bird species count in 2011, and we do this every year at President's Day. It's a free event open to the public, and our goal is to document the total number of species we can see in one day. Um, and that's during kind of the peak of all of our flooded acreage and with all of our native habitat that's permanent, we are learning all the small, small, very difficult birds to see, which is really fun. Our record is 97 species and we hit that this year, but the total number to hit, if we could do it, would be 121. We also have a very active hunting club. Um, it was established initially to build um, conservation on the property. We have a very avid wood duck habitat program with uh, over 45 nesting boxes and we work with California waterfowl to provide nesting habitat. Each of the um, boxes are checked every year. We have a big field day. It's coming up in May. Um, it is also free and open to the public and people can learn how to build wood boxes um, and they also can help us check them. The funds that are generated through our hunting club are uh, dedicated to conservation every year and these are used as matching funds. So here's just a few of the fun stats to date. Uh, we've been doing the seasonal habitat for 11 years and we provide habitat for over 230 species, which is pretty awesome. Uh, so we'll go to our permanent habitat. Working with the Sacramento River Forum, they've actually been the facilitators of the Safe Harbor Agreement, which is through the US Fish and Wildlife. We have the only, or we had the first agreement in Calusa County um, and it protects our conservation efforts. So we are providing habitat for endangered species and that does make a landowner a little nervous, especially um, if you have a host plant or habitat in a place that you don't want and there's lots of restrictions. So this actually allows protection on both sides. Um, I've included a link here, it's quite an awesome program. They're focused along the whole Sacramento River riparian and it's a pretty good stretch, um, but we're looking specifically to protect uh, the elderberry longhorn beetle and the swainson hawk, giant garter snake, and probably the monarch butterfly here soon. Here is a map of all our um, hedgerows that are planted around the headquarters. We started around the headquarters because we wanted a place to bring people who came for meetings just right out the door and say, here's what's happening on the ag lands, but then also check out this great wildlife habitat. So um, these are some of the hedgerows there. To date, we started planning in 2009 and the goal was to establish hundred acres we've successfully restored 57 acres by planting with different groups and then also in-house to complement our river jungle of 36 acres. So we are at 93 acres so far. There's been 42 different species of natives planted on the property and these hedgerows bring a lot of interest. So we give several tours a year usually. So um, we've been tracking that number and it's over 2000, which is pretty exciting. And over 300 of those have been students that have come to help um, on the property, help plant, learn about agriculture, learn about conservation and careers that are around all of the industry, which is pretty neat. Oh, and then I threw in our little carbon, carbon sequestered to date, uh, which is pretty significant um, and shows the importance of having permanent habitat on the property. Um, each hedgerow is different in species and uh, the locations were also different as well. 
we're trying to figure out what we needed to do, what worked best, what worked best for us, what worked best around the headquarters. And uh, so we have several different plant mixes and it is really beautiful in the spring when everything comes into bloom. Our first hydro was planted in 2009 along Sycamore Slough Road. This was done in-house and funded by Davis Ranches in partnership with Audubon as our advisors. We weren't sure what we were getting into. We didn't know how long it would take, what materials were needed, um, if our tenants would be excited about it. But this photo shows basically what it looked like. So it was a very clean field edge and the field, and then you have a road. So there's no habitat there for um, insects that would be beneficial for pollination or any birds. Um, so it's, it's amazing to see the progression over time. Again, here's our first oak tree dedicated to our leader of conservation, Pearl Devon. She was our chairwoman for the past decade. And here it is again, 10 years later. So it's pretty exciting to see. Our next hedro was planted in 2010. Uh, this one was the first section of Sycamore Slough, which is a, the um, historic tributary from the Sacramento River. This one was heavily grass focused um, because we had a grassland specialist on the team. So that was fun to learn the different native grasses and to see um, how recruitment happened over time. This uh, is our hedgerow along the entrance driveway. We had old walnuts that needed to be taken out. Um, and this area had been sprayed pretty rigor rigorously for the past probably 15 years. There's rumors that someone would land their plane there back in the day or maybe even go golfing because it was nice and flat and they didn't want anything growing there. But now it is um, successfully revegetated uh, and it provides a lot of great refuge. This project is with Morningstar and Unilever along with Audubon California. It was our first project that focused um, on all three sides of a row crop field. Um, so the hedgerows are actually plumbed in and we saw the most growth here because it was also getting fertigated at the same time, which is a pretty ingenious thing. Um, and our tenants actually came up with that idea. So it was pretty neat. Uh, our hedgerow along 45 gets a lot of attention. It's probably the largest frontage that we have on the property. Um, and it does provide a nice windbreak for between uh, the traffic and then all of our fields. And it's one of the prettiest. They tend to have the most poppies on this one. This is our Sneeze Barn, now known as the Mural Barn. And this is um, one of the central locations for all of our outdoor education events and workshops. This is an old dilapidated barn and one of our owners really wanted to save it. So we committed that be to, committed to having it be a centerpiece for all of our conservation work. And the plantings around the barn are a demonstration of what the plants will look like over time. So when students are out and they're planting tiny little plugs of deer grass and they're like, well, what does this really look like? We have an opportunity to say, okay, well, here's, this is a little plant and this is what it will look like. In all of our habitat, we are working to provide monarch butterfly refuge and um, have included milkweed species as well. We have two different kinds that are naturally recruited on the property, which are the narrow leaf and the showy milkweed. But now we are working to figure out how to produce it um, on a more production scale so we can uh, grow out starts for the local area. This is another section of the slough that we were restored. Um, it was our burn pile. So you can see that there's a lot of effort that goes in. We change the elevation. Um, it was very challenging to establish these grasses because it was right in the middle of the drought the first go around. Um, but here it is today, or here it is in 2019, and we have a nice conservation trail. So you can walk from the mural barn all the way out to the Sacramento River, which is pretty nice. This is the Sacramento River intake. This is where the sycamore slough would have originally connected to the river. Um, this one was exciting because this had the most variation of the forbs and flowers. Uh, we learned a lot on this hedgerow in terms of how to manage the weeds. It was very challenging because we had mixed broadleaves and grasses together. So you really had a tough time 
getting rid of the invasives without damaging the native species. And this is our longest hedgerow. So this is going to be connecting, uh, this is our main focus with connecting the river riparian all the way to the wildlife refuge. The five and a half to seven and a half, depending on how you measure it, uh, miles of hedgerow. Uh, and this is a main thoroughfare. So all of the farmers on our property and several people in Galusta County cut through our property here and um, see our work. And it actually has inspired several of our neighbors to the south of us to start planting hedgerows as well. A lot of the work that we've done focuses um, on education, obviously, but we've been working with many seniors on their senior projects and they come out and learn about conservation. They do a public speaking event and um, they you know, document their hours and are present as a requirement to graduate high school. So it's been an opportunity to help kids there as well. And we finally finished this year, I guess it was mid pandemic <laughs> with our final section that connects us all the way to the river, right, or from the river to the refuge. So for perspective, here's a map. You can see all of our hedro, hedros around the headquarters here. And we start at the river and then we go all the way to the refuge, um, which is pretty exciting. And that was one of our number one conservation goals other than 100 acres. And the total right now is 57. Many of the programs with students were coordinated through the SLUS program with Center for Land-Based Learning. Um, it is a nonprofit organization out of Yolo County. And we worked a lot with the Calusa High School Environmental Science Academy. And these are juniors and seniors in the area, and they've been a really big help. And that's all I've got for me right now. I can take questions. Um, and I think that they're all via chat box. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much, Emily. Um, yeah. We do have a, a question that came in. Um, so the question is, what is the optimal distance between hedgerows? Do they need to connect directly or if adjacent, what distance is recommended? Oh, that's a great question. Might be a better question for Sasha. I think she's working on connectivity. Um, I don't know if there's like a best distance, but I do think that the more there's connectivity, the better, just because you're not, um, you're allowing for more fluid movement and uh, safe refuge between all of them. So uh, if you can get them to connect, that's not a bad way to go. Great. Um, I, so I don't see any other questions, but it, maybe we'll just hang out for a second and see if anybody else is adding any questions to the chat box. Um, we have a few minutes um, before we get started with Rachel's presentation. Um, yeah, anybody else have any questions? It looks like I have some direct ones so I can get. Oh. <laughs> um, so we have worked with Thursday, not directly, but I've done a lot of um, field days with them. They do a lot of good public outreach and they do have an excellent species list if you are looking for ones in your area. And let's see here. Oh, wow. There's a, um, okay. Many of these I'm going to have to answer because I don't have the information. There's a question about uh, average rainfall, etc. So let me see here. The avian diversity is pretty extensive um, and it varies throughout the year. We see a lot more of the shorebirds uh, in the spring and early fall because they're migrating. We do have a lot of permanent small birds on the property. I can give you guys a full list of what we look for. There should be a link in the presentation um, and it documents what we've seen for the past three years. And then if you look on eBird, there's a full list of the 121 species that have been documented on our property to date. So if you're an avid birder and in the area, you're welcome to come out and try to find them all. Um, Emily, and I, yeah. I did get another question. Um, okay. What are the economics of this work? Does it reduce field productivity? And um, do other farms nearby find this work intriguing or threatening? That's a great question. Um, so the economics are interesting. 
what we've been able to do with our matching funds, we've actually received several grants and uh, we do have a budget, which I'm happy to share uh, with general earthworks, uh, weed maintenance in terms of field prep for planting. And then the number of species we work with cornflower farms, hydro farms, and uh, I think it's floral native out of Chico. And they've been our main sources for the native plants. Um, all the prices are pretty similar. So I can, I'm happy to share that with you. And um, we are planting these hedgerows not in ag fields. They're on borders, on road edges, along waterways. So we're not taking fields out of production. Um, so we're not seeing a reduction of productivity um, in terms of agricultural productivity. And uh, farmers in the area, it's a mixed bag. So when we first started working, we got several letters from the uh, Coast County Farm Bureau and from the Ag Commissioner telling us to cease and desist because we were planting elderberries on our property. Um, and that is a controversial plant. As you know, it hosts the endangered species, the elderberry long, longhorn elderberry beetle. And uh, farmers really don't like that plant because if it's on your property, you can't remove it, especially if it's over one inch in diameter. But with our safe harbor agreement, it kind of protects ourselves and our neighbors. So if there is a plant that comes, uh, comes to fruition in an inconvenient spot, say your field, we have an actual number of historic plants that have been documented on the property, and that's our baseline. So we can always go and remove something that's problematic and replace it, and our baseline is two. So we've planted probably 350 total, and if it ever really became a problem, we're protected with our safe harbor agreement, and we can reduce our number back to two if it ever became a real problem. But for the most part, our neighbors are really excited. And we, we have been seeing a lot of folks along Sycamore Slough start to do restoration, which is great. Great. I think we have time for um, this one last question that came in. Um, mm -hmm. What plants did Davis Ranch decide to plant in the hedgerows? So what plants do you have? Ooh, there's a lot of them. My favorite is probably the Dark Star Theonosis because it is a beautiful color. It's a very dark purple. I think they used, we used it in the invitation <laughs> to today's event. Um, we have red buds, we have toyon, coffee berry, um, mule fat. Uh, ooh, so many. I have a full species list uh, that I'm happy to share as well. But uh, there's also several different grasses that worked really really well. The, the creeping wild rye was probably the most successful. It's hard to establish initially, but once it gets going, it is a nice ground cover. It thatches out all of the invasives, and uh, we actually have been using goats to graze all of our native habitat, and um, we've seen a lot of uh, positive response because we used to mow them, and that was time-consuming and took a lot of gas. And now we just have the goats out there and the, and the plants respond a lot better. Great. Um, so Emily, did I hear you correctly that you'd be willing to share your plant list with everyone? Yeah, no problem. Okay. Great. Um, someone had just asked about that. Um, so yeah, we will um, send out with the recording. I can, I can include that in an updated resource in the resources. So okay. thank you so much, Emily. Um, we really appreciate your, your presentation and hosting us um, virtually at Davis Ranches. Um, I think we're gonna um, hand it over now to Rachel Long, um, who is going to share her screen and talk to us about her work. Take it away, right. Rachel. Okay, well, well, thank you and uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for, for being here today. And, uh, and thanks also to, uh, to Shelly and Joanne for putting all this together. And uh, Emily, that was just a fantastic talk. It's really inspiring to, to see what can be done for diversifying our farmlands uh, through planting these hedgerows on farms uh, without taking land out of production. And really that's the key is how do we, how do we integrate the, uh, this wildlife habitat with farming so that it's a win-win situation for both the environment and wildlife and also for food production and fiber production that, uh, that we all need. 
So, uh, so thank you, Emily. That was, uh, was really neat to see everything that you're doing. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. So um, great. So can, uh, can everyone see this okay? Okay, great. Good. So can everybody hear me too? Yep. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, so my talk is going to focus on the benefits of hedgerows on farms, and we certainly heard a lot uh, from from Emily about all the uh, the benefits that they're seeing, in particular for birds and uh, and and diversity. And so, so my talk is going to focus on. Uh, um, the, these ecosystem services and this research that uh, that I've been doing uh, on hedgerows with my colleagues for gosh you know about uh, about 30 years now, and uh, this is one of my favorite hedgerows uh, in uh, in Yolo County because I just love redbud and uh, redbud is a native uh, plant for California and it's blooming right now and uh, I enjoy I've just been enjoying a lot of hummingbirds that have been flying around uh, these plants. So hedgerows are just rows of trees, shrubs, grasses that uh, surround farm fields. And gosh, you know, I would love to see our California landscapes look something like this. This is actually uh, from England. And, and uh, you know, they've been around for, for centuries and uh, either relics of cleared lands or, or direct plantings. I think that's that dark star, uh, Ceanothus there on the left. And that's a neat plant because it's also a, a nitrogen fixer, fixes nitrogen. And uh, so it's really important for, for habitats. Um, and uh, so these hedgerows have, uh, have been used uh, in England, for example, for you know, marking boundaries or fencing for livestock. Uh, in the Midwest in the 1930s, uh, during the Dust Bowl era, there was a lot of hedgerows that were planted for, uh, uh, for windbreaks, for soil conservation. And, uh, and then John Anderson, he's in the center there with the hat on, he, uh, he was instrumental in, in really showcasing hedgerows uh, in California for, uh, for basically wildlife habitat. He really enjoyed uh, hunting birds, uh, game birds uh, like pheasants, and just really wanted to create more habitat on farms for, for wildlife. And in California, it's, it's so important that we have habitat. This is uh, the lower right. This is essentially our central valley. It's amazing in terms of the productivity and all the different crops that we grow, but it is at the, at the cost of, uh, of a tremendous loss of uh, wildlife habitat. So planting uh, uh, shrubs and trees, grasses, flowers on field edges really does make a difference in terms of, uh, of really enhancing uh, biodiversity. And then we get benefits from, from it as well. So what I'm gonna do for the rest of my talk is focus on some of the, uh, the, the data, share some of the information that we've gathered over the years through colleagues at UC Davis and UC Berkeley and uh, some of the speakers here to, uh, to showcase the, the, the benefits from these uh, field edge uh, planting. So, so one is certainly birds. We've heard a lot already about birds and Sasha Heath is gonna talk more about, about the uh, um, ability of birds to help control pests, insectivorous birds that uh, like this robin uh, on the left. But planting hedgerows on farms uh, that numerous studies have, have shown that, uh, that you definitely get an increase in bird abundance and also diversity as, as opposed to like these, uh, the weedy field edges and the more complex the hedgerows, the, the more birds that are attracted to those, uh, those farms. I think what was really interesting is that, that, uh, that a, a lot of times I'll get calls from farmers or other people saying, well, if I plant uh, this habitat, am I gonna get like inundated with pest birds like starlings and blackbirds and cowbirds and crows, these big flocking birds that can be pests in, in our ag systems. And, uh, and the answer is, is no, that those flocking birds are really queuing in on, on the crop as opposed to the hedgerows. And these hedgerows are, are actually fairly small on a landscape scale. So, so on, on the top on the right, that this is a hedgerow that's in Yolo County and, uh, and from the ground and then from an aerial view where there's a star, that's the hedgerow from an aerial view. And you can see that they actually are pretty small on a landscape scale. And so they're not, you know, basically places where flocking birds go to, uh, to, to hang out. Those flocking birds are really going to crops. And, and I mentioned uh, in, in that video that, that you guys, uh, that was shown earlier that, uh, that it is important to know 
like your pest birds and your beneficial birds and when they're when the birds can be pests and when they can be uh, beneficial and uh, for example these uh, flocking birds uh, a lot of them um, pretty much feed on insects early in the season because they need the the their baby birds uh, that need a high energy source so they may be feeding on mostly on insect pests early in the season and then later in the season that they'll they'll shift to uh, to feeding on on seeds and we do grow a lot of seed crops like not only hybrid seed like sunflower onion seed and such but also small grains and uh, and so you may want to attract these birds early in the season to feed on pests but later in the season that that you need to figure out a way to uh, to to basically uh, push them out of the area and my colleagues at the Thule Lake Research and Extension Center there's a university field station that's up in uh, far northern California and uh, we have problems with uh, flocks of birds feeding on uh, on cereal grains uh, in our trials, and so uh, they uh, they've been using this inflatable uh, waving man to uh, to try to uh, deter birds. And for the small flocking birds, it actually works really well. And uh, uh, for geese, it doesn't. You know, we've had big problems with geese this year feeding on wheat fields and uh, alfalfa, and uh, that won't work for geese. But for the smaller flocking birds, that works really well. So how about other wildlife? And one of the projects I was really interested in looking at is whether or not uh, these corridors just harbor, you know, huge uh, numbers of like, you know, like foxes and coyotes and deer. And, uh, and so we did a study where we actually put game cameras into the hedgerows uh, and then also into just weedy field edges. So, so on the left is our hedgerow uh, next to a field and on the right is a field of tomatoes and it's just got field bindweed and you can see the cameras are in the foreground. And we also put out traps uh, for monitoring for rodents like uh, voles and mice and uh, and we and these are live traps, so we don't we're not killing the uh, the mice. We're we're live trapping them to uh, to monitor that activity of uh, of rodents and other wildlife in the hedgerows and in these uh, these what we call the control field edges where there's no hedgerow, and uh, and I was a little bit surprised that we didn't see much difference uh, in terms of. Uh, animal activity between the hedgerow and the uh, conventional field edge. And, uh, and this is just a list of the different animals that we saw the, uh, in the control. That's the hatch bar and the hedgerow is the number of animals in the hedgerow. And that's just a list of the different animals that, that we found. And so, and so uh, what it tells me is that these, a lot of animals are using these uh, landscapes at uh, just a much larger scale than, than just these, uh, the hedgerows. So, so while hedgerows are certainly good for birds and natural enemies, insects and bees, uh, for animals there was a uh, there was a, a lot of a lot of uh, movement uh, in, around the fields and and uh, and so people over the years have, were, have been concerned that uh, that you know hedgerows are sources of rodents and they're sources of food safety pathogens and uh, that's just not the case at all. They they again are just too small on a larger landscape to be. Uh, to be a big driver for rodent populations or animal populations. So, so, so we actually teamed up with the uh, UC Davis Center for Food Safety on this project. And, uh, and essentially that it's, it's well known that they're not a problem for food safety issues. Um, but uh, one, one animal that does come up are desert cottontail rabbits. And boy, they look cute, but that's a disguise because uh, they love hedgerows. And, uh, and sometimes over a long period of time, they can build up in numbers. And if you look in that field at the top left, that I can, I think I'd get my pointer. Um, you can see the, uh, let's see if I can, well, anyways, it's, uh, this is all like there's some stand loss there. And, and that's a result of the uh, rabbits coming out and feeding on, on uh, you know, from the hedgerow out into the field. And so the uh, farmers to address this issue that they actually hired some, or not hired, they had some falconers come out and, uh, and help to, uh, to control the, these uh, rabbits in this field when they got too numerous. But essentially, you know, animals are present regardless of this field edge habitat, these mammals and, uh, and food safety is not an issue with hedgerows. They're too small uh, on a larger landscape scale to have a big impact and, one, and rodents are everywhere. And I can guarantee as soon as you disc, they disc this tomato crop on the upper right, the rodents will move to the next field over. So, um, 
So, but the good news is there's no issue for food safety. Um, hedgerows also help with uh, weed suppression uh, that we've done some studies and monitoring uh, the uh, weeds and hedgerows and, and always fewer weeds and fewer um, different types of weeds in the hedgerows because of course they're shading the weeds out. Um, what we do find though is that, uh, that actually there's uh, these white crowned sparrows that, uh, that, that sort of flitter around these hedgerows and they'll come out and they'll feed on, uh, on the weeds and, and help to suppress any weeds further. And, and that brings to, to mind that, that uh, when you're planting a hedgerow, if you're direct seeding crops, it's really important to have a, like a barrier between the hedgerow and the crop because these white crowned sparrows will come out if you've got a direct seeded vegetable crop and, uh, and feed on those little seedlings and cause, it can cause quite a bit of damage. So that's something important to uh, pay attention to. Hedgerows also help out with erosion control. This is at John Anderson's farm uh, in winters and uh, he planted a lot of native grasses on the field edges to prevent erosion. I was out there recently and lots of meadowlarks, which are just really lovely to hear their, uh, their call. Uh, the uh, hedgerows can serve as filter traps. Uh, this is a, a hedgerow that, that's right near John Anderson's farm and, uh, and this, these, uh, these, these hedgerows in these sort of riparian areas are incredibly important for trapping sediments, nutrients, pesticides, and any foodborne pathogens. And so the more that we can put these filter strips on the edges of field to sort of trap a lot of sediments moving off site is, is really important. And I always enjoy uh, seeing the uh, great blue herons like this one uh, that, uh, that's got a, uh, a gopher that, uh, that's about to, to eat. That's pretty amazing, but they're really good predators. And uh, carbon sequestration, Emily mentioned a little bit about this in terms of uh, that, uh, that there's a grad student, Jessica Chiartis uh, from UC Davis, who's doing a study looking at, uh, at carbon sequestration in hedgerows and found that 20% uh, that greater carbon sequestration in those hedgerows than the adjacent uh, uh, crops. And, uh, and, and I loved her comment that, that, uh, that actually the uh, biodiversity in the soils below the hedgerows is, is, is much greater than she thinks than what's occurring above ground. And, uh, and uh, she said she finds all kinds of critters under there, salamanders and, and centipedes and, and earthworms. And, uh, and so I'd say that's a whole area that I think is pretty exciting to, uh, to continue to look at with healthy soils. And, and, uh, and what I still enjoy are the birds, as Emily had said, I like these, uh, the logger hedge shrikes, which uh, you'll find using hedgerows. You won't find them in weedy areas uh, or ditches or anything. They really, really like the, the, uh, the cover of, uh, of these uh, hedgerow species. And uh, these guys feed on insects and uh, I think small rodents and, uh, and even uh, lizards if they can catch them. So a lot of my work is focused on, uh, on, on looking at uh, uh, pest control benefits associated with hedgerows. And uh, one is that uh, these uh, hedgerows are really important um, for, for basically serving as uh, replacement vegetation uh, for weedy areas that, uh, that, that you just find huge numbers of pests. Uh, for example, this mustard, it's blooming right now everywhere. Every single one of these pests, the aphids, ligus, flea beetles, cucumber beetles, is just there in those in those uh, mustard and radish plants, wild radish and malva or cheeseweed. Those all these insect pests just love those weeds. I think a lot of them are introduced, and these weeds are introduced, and they're just going to their favorite host, as opposed to this one uh, in the hedgerow planted here on a farm with tomatoes. Uh, that uh, they just you know that's toyon or Christmas berry, and they just don't like it. They prefer the weeds. So, so what happens is that these, uh, these insects will build up on this mustard radish malva, they'll reproduce, and when that dries down, then they move into the adjacent crop. So if you could figure a way of replacing that vegetation with a managed vegetation, then, uh, then you can really significantly help to reduce the, uh, the pest pressure. And I wanted just to mention that, you know, that, that a lot of times that you'll hear people say, well, I'm worried about habitat, you know, it's going to increase pests, but it's, it has to do with the right habitat. So for example, stink bugs, which is the major pest of tomatoes, because it causes the, the feeding damage causes this uh, essentially like dis, uh, rot in the, in the tomatoes, like shown on the right, that they overwinter as adults on uh, 
like Himalayan blackberry. And so they love to be protected and tucked under, under like a protected area during the winter time. And about March, the adults come out and of this, uh, this blackberry and reproduce on mustard, radish, and malva. When that dries down, they move into, into the tomato crops and cause a lot of damage. And same with um, like with Pierce's disease in, in grapes. I mean, that's a huge problem. And uh, the, it's vectored by this uh, leafhopper called a, a blue-green sharpshooter. And that insect is picking up that Pierce's disease from two major hosts. One is the Himalayan blackberry and the other is vinca or periwinkle. And of course they could pick it up from disease vines, but anyways, they're carrying it from these weedy hosts into, into our crops. And so choosing that, the, the right plants, like the native California plants is critical for, for looking for ways to, to basically reduce pest populations and any diseases that, uh, that they might carry to adjacent crops. So um, hedgerows are also critically important for, uh, for natural enemies. Hedgerows of flowering plants are needed by most of our beneficial insects that, uh, that they depend on pollen and nectar as adults. So in the top is a surfid fly. It's also called a bee fly feeding on that uh, purple and yellow flower. And that's just going for that pollen. And it'll lay eggs on leaves where there's aphids and that egg hatches. And then you see that larva that's there holding an aphid in its mouth that's about to chow down on it. And, uh, and then below, this is, the, uh, this is what's called a hypocytor wasp right here. And I'm gonna see if I can just do a, uh, try my laser pointer, oops, the daisies. I'm just gonna try my, I couldn't quite get the laser pointer, sorry. But uh, the, a lot of our beneficial wasps, their parasitoids are parasites, like this one shown here. This is a, a one that feeds on caterpillar, it's called uh, hypocytor. But they're in the bee family and they need nectar and pollen as adults. I mean, that's how they thrive. And this one is uh, just grabbing a worm, it's stinging it, it'll lay an egg inside, the egg hatches and you get this uh, green larvae when you pull apart the caterpillar and then that uh, will pupate into that uh, black and white cocoon and you can just see the remnants of the caterpillar right there. And, uh, and so these are incredibly important out there. And what we found is that if you have hedgerows of flowering plants, that you'll more than double the activity of these uh, beneficial wasps on farms. And when I say a wasp, I'm not talking about, you know, big old hornet, it's, these are tiny. You know, this one is about probably, I don't know, the tip of a pencil. So they're really small and we hardly notice them, but they're out there working for us. And, um, and the hedgerows, not only are they supporting these, uh, the, these beneficial uh, parasitoid wasps, but they're also exporting them into, into adjacent crops. So this is a uh, tomatoes, processing tomatoes with uh, toyon, which is Christmas berry. It has those red berries in, in the background. Uh, stink bugs are a major pest of tomatoes. And, uh, and, and what we found is that, uh, that if you have a hedgerow, that, uh, that, that the, uh, you're getting much better control of pests like these uh, stink bugs, uh, again, that are big pests of tomatoes. And uh, by these little, little parasitoid wasps, this is one called Trisulcus that feeds on stink bug egg masses. But by having a hedgerow, we were able to double the, uh, the amount of uh, parasitization that was happening uh, in stink bugs, in tomatoes, way out, I mean, up to 600 feet out. So halfway across the fields uh, that, uh, that we were getting better, better pest control. And this actually led to, uh, to a reduction in, in the amount of pesticides used. So, so those farmers that had hedgerows uh, that in our studies didn't have to spray for aphids and stink bugs as much as those farmers that did not have any hedgerows of flowering plants on their farm. So clearly they're beneficial and, uh, and also uh, beneficial for our bees and uh, that we have a lot of native bees out there like the leaf cutter bee on the left and the bumblebee on the right that uh, nests in the uh, soil. And by planting hedgerows of flowering plants, we're providing nectar and pollen for these bees. But, but, um, but we're also providing places for, for them to live that, uh, that leaf cutter bees will be in the stems of, of, of twigs and uh, logs and, uh, 
and the, the bumblebees are, are in the ground. And so when you're putting up, uh, uh, say, nest boxes for birds, it's also critically important to, uh, to put up some, maybe some bee boxes with these holes in there. And, uh, and if you take a look and open up those holes that, uh, that what you'll find are little uh, bee larvae in there uh, with the different colored pollen uh, with the, uh, the bees uh, um, uh, you know, going out and foraging with the purple and orange and such. So I think that's, that's kind of fun to see. Um, just a couple more slides uh, that uh, we have quantified uh, the, uh, the benefits of these hedgerows in terms of pest control and pollination services in adjacent crops. And, and we know that it costs about $4,000 to plant a hedgerow that's about 1,000 feet long with, uh, with just different types of, uh, of, of native California flowering plants. And what we find is for pest control alone in the, in the black uh, line with the black dots, that it takes about, uh, it'll take about 15 years in, in um, pesticide savings uh, uh, to, to eventually pay the hedgerow off. So, so every year, you know, if you don't have to spray, then that's a savings right there. So, so again, if for pest control alone, it's about 15 years. And I know it seems like a lot, but the fact that you can even measure it is pretty amazing. But then if you add in pollination services, like better seed set from the native bees, then, then that hedgerow will actually pay off in, in about uh, seven years after restoration. And then you get to you know, have a little bit of, uh, of revenue that you start actually saving money and, make, and essentially then making money. And if we can add in uh, insectivorous birds into this, uh, into this um, model that, uh, that's based on real data, then, then you can recoup those, uh, you know, those uh, costs even, even sooner. So, um, so th there's lots of plants. I just I, 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 I love the spring flowering ones like the red bud, flannel bush, uh, the yellow and the, the, of course the ceanothus and the forbs like poppies and lupin. And, uh, and elderberry, uh, the UC, uh, the CEREP program, Sustainable Ag and Research and Education program is really doing a lot of work now on, on the value of elderberries as a, uh, as a cash crop for, uh, for making elderberry syrup, which, is a, uh, which has got a lot of uh, health properties. And, uh, and so if you're interested in, in a planting elderberries as a, as a cash crop, then, then take a look at Sarep's uh, website there. And, uh, and birds love elderberries too. And from everything I've heard is just there's plenty to share. And the birds oftentimes are you know, feeding on uh, way up high in, in the elderberries. So there's um, in the, the field edges uh, on farms are intensively used for various purposes, whether it's water conveyance or accessing fields or, or crop storage or for irrigation. And, uh, and yet there's always places to, uh, to put these hedgerows, like, like uh, along fence lines or terraces left over from, from land leveling. And, uh, and, and I've certainly enjoyed the, the hedgerows and in particular, like the birds, uh, the uh, uh, goldfinches and such that, uh, that I see the flocks of them coming through uh, farms. And uh, one, one note is the, the, the native sunflowers, uh, they're, they're my favorite, but if you've got hybrid seed, sunflower seed production occurring within a mile, then you cannot grow these, uh, these, these sunflowers because they will um, interfere with the, um, uh, with the sunflower uh, hybrid seed production and the purity of that seed. So, um, so there's great resources. Uh, this is a, a, a fantastic one that, that, uh, that you can uh, um, get, I guess, online, or maybe Shelly or, or, or Joanne can suggest where to get this. It's a fantastic resource for planting hedgerows on farms. And if you're interested in more of the data that we have, that, uh, that uh, we wrote this uh, article for California Agriculture about hedgerows and sustainability. And a lot of the data that I presented is, is referenced in, uh, in publications in this, uh, in this paper. So, so thank you, everyone. Happy to answer questions. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Rachel. Um, I, I know we're running just a few minutes um, behind schedule, but I think we have built in enough time that we can um, do your five minutes of questions now. Okay. Um, so let's see, there are a couple of questions here in the chat box. One is, do hedge, hedgerows require a lot of water? And what are the species of plants and trees that are most drought tolerant? 
Yeah, hedgerows, so hedgerows do require water, especially for, for getting them established. Plant them in the fall, they're perennials, uh, deep, deep, you know, tap roots, and uh, they do need water, and, uh, and at least for the first three years of, of establishment. And then a lot of the uh, plants that, that, that I've uh, shown here um, in these uh, dry areas, just, um, they, you know, they can tolerate no water for, um, they're just, they're drought tolerant plants, and that's why I like California natives. Great. Um, the next question you kind of answered already too is, um, are the hedgerow plants drought resistant? And um, you, you mentioned that many of the natives are um, once they're established. And so, yeah. Does anybody have any other questions? I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions for Rachel. Sometimes, Rachel, you might want to also look in your chat to see if anybody sent any questions to you, directly to you as well. Stop sharing. Um, let's see. Yeah, I think that, that was it. And if there's any more that, that I could just answer them, it looks like. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah uh, some, somebody commented, we love great blue herons, the best goat for hunters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Rachel. Really appreciate your time and, and sharing all of that wonderful research and, and information. So um, now we're going to move on to Sasha Heath, um, who's going to share her screen and talk about her research. Okay. Can you hear me and see me? Yes. Excellent. <laughs> All right. Yes, thank you uh, for the introduction. And Rachel, thank you for that great talk. It's always good to see all of the different benefits of um, I'm going to focus in specifically on the benefits for birds and also the benefits for farmers through pest control provided by birds. Um, so I'm really going to dig into the weeds, no pun intended, on some of the ecology of the birds that we're seeing out there. Um, here we go. So it's undeniable that agriculture has a really big impact on birds. And um, for all of the globally threatened bird species across the planet, um, agricultural expansion and intensification by far is the leading cause of um, the leading threat for birds, just in terms of the amount of habitat that's been taken, um, the amount of pesticides that are damaging to birds that have been applied to these landscapes. Um, so undeniably, it's, it's um, a rough go for birds in terms of the overall landscape effects of agriculture. However, through time, despite the fact that we've lost a lot of these habitats, birds also occupy farmlands in the billions. And so really what we're trying to shift to here recently is exactly why we're doing this talk today is what can we do to these ag on these agricultural lands to make them beneficial for birds so that we can reduce some of those declines and also, also maybe harness um, some of their beneficial um, pest control services at the same time. Just trying to get my window set up over here. Okay, so... Um, and one way we can do that potentially is to add these local biodiversity enhancements and hedgerows as an example. So here's just um, four different crops with different types of hedgerows on the edges. Her, um, uh, Rachel and Emily have both um, demonstrated some of the great benefits of hedgerows. Um, but it's important to think about kind of how birds look at the landscape and how they might respond to some of the habitat that we work, work that we do on these farms. So. Um, there's something called the Johnson's um, four levels of habitat selection. And this is something that birds employ, all animals employ, but we'll do it from the perspective of birds. So the first um, scale is sort of the ge geographical range of a species. So birds are going to select habitats on a really huge scale. This is like continental global scales, right? So here's a picture of um, a yellow rumped warblers breeding range. The blue is where they spend time in the winter. The orange is where they spend time on migration. And the red is where they spend time during the breeding season. So the birds that we're um, attracting to our farms, each of them has a completely different map. And we need to think about sort of what species are here, why they're choosing it, and also when they're choosing it. The second level of habitat selection from birds is a sort of home range or an individual or social group level, which is right here on the top right. And so this is like their territory during the breeding season. Even some birds hold territories during the winter. And so each of these circles represents an individual bird that selected the territory with its pair. And it's foraging within that, it's breeding within that. And so in an agricultural landscape like this, where you have um, 
uh, orchards next to a, a breeding or a river, um, some natural habitat. There's birds that are going to be selecting mostly that hedgerow, and there's some birds that are going to mostly be selecting the edge of the crop and that sort of thing. So this is another level that birds uh, investigate when they're trying to select where they spend time. The third are the habitat components within those individual social groups or territories. So this is something like the size of a hedgerow or the edge of an orchard, um, whether it's a grassy field, that sort of thing. And then the fourth level is even a finer scale, which is the resources within that habitat that they select. So this might be anything from the where places where birds forage, what kind of diet they eat. Um, for example, do they choose trees that have smooth bark like this or really jagged bark like this? Do they eat seeds? Do they eat moths that fly in the air? Do they eat cocoons that hang out and bark under trees? Do they hang out, do they eat larvae? Each species will have kind of a different characteristic in this way. And so these are sort of all the different scales we need to investigate or think about when we're thinking about birds using farms and benefits from birds. So that's how I'm going to structure my talk. The first question I want to ask is, do habitats on the farms like hedgerows provide habitat for birds? And Rachel's already really given a lot of um, examples of how it does, and I'm going to give a few more. Um, why do we want birds on our farms? Well, because we love them. They're beautiful. We want to help them. We want to reverse their declines. Everybody enjoys birds. Farmers enjoys birds, enjoy birds. Business people enjoy birds. Almost everybody I know enjoys birds. But they're especially beneficial for, grower, beneficial for growers and for humans because they provide us a lot of services, including seed dispersal and pollination. But for farmers in particular, we really um, benefit from the insectivory or their insect eating um, capabilities and also their rodent control, such as this barn owl. And these are, each of these crops across the globe is a different study where somebody has demonstrated that birds reduce pests in these various crops, sometimes reducing crop damage, sometimes even re, um, increasing yield. So these are all examples where reduced crop pests in, to benefit farmers. So the second question is, we know that birds will reduce pests, but does having something like a hedgerow improve that surface? So does hedgerow, do hedgerows improve pest reduction by birds in the adjacent crops? Thirdly, the crops themselves are really different, right? So we have row crops, we have orchards, we have um, young orchards, like this smooth bark of a young orchard, um, really ragged orchard bark. Um, so the type of crop we have, um, the season that the crop is growing, the phenology of the crop, all those things are also going to determine what birds are using our lands. So my third question is, how important are the crop characteristics? And then finally, um, birds are also paying attention to the landscape at a much greater scale, right? They fly, a bird's eye view is a good term for a reason. Um, so I'm really curious about how what we do on farms, individual farmers do on their own land, interacts with what's going in the larger landscape. So for example, on the left here, farmland in Yolo County with cash so there's a lot of diversity and heterogeneity, we call it in the environment. And on the right here, we have a really simplified landscape with very few hedgerows, maybe a tiny little ditch, that sort of thing. These two landscapes look really different to birds. And a farm that's in the middle of the landscape on the right might respond really differently than a farm um, in the landscape on the left. So my last question or last thing I want to talk about today is how important is the surrounding landscape? And so to answer the first question, I worked with some colleagues um, from Nature Conservancy and Audubon. And we asked um, kind of how do these hedgerows in the landscape influence birds? And are there differences in the characteristics of the hedgerows themselves that might attract birds more than others? Um, so we worked in Yolo and Solano counties. We cho chose over 11, 111 um, farm edges. 49 of them were clean, like this one up here on the left. Some of them just had simple tree lines. Some had actually planted hedgerows and some was either remnant riparian habitat or replanted riparian habitat. And we found that overall, riparian habitat, hedgerows, tree lines, all had more bird species than these clean edges on the left. And that this happened in both years of the study. So by far, whether you had even a simple tree line or a hedgerow or a riparian habitat, were all more beneficial in terms of the amount of species of birds that you attract than a clean edge. Um, and most important, interestingly, even in this one year, something like a hedgerow was even as beneficial as like a wider, more robust riparian area. Okay, so do habitat on farms like hedgerows? Yes, they absolutely do. So what about um, the orchard characteristics or the characteristics of the farm next to the, next to the hedgerows? Um, this is like pretty complicated. The main thing to point out is that 
the white bar means there's um, a row crop adjacent to that hedgerow and the gray bar means there are both orchards on either side of the hedgerow. And this is just to show that even in something like a hedgerow or a riparian hedgerow or a tree line or even a bare weedy area, it really does depend on what you have on the edge of the crop, whether it's an orchard or a row crop um, in terms of the total number of birds you're going to attract to your hedgerow. So how important are the crop characteristics? Super important. Okay, so finally, how important is the landscape? This is my favorite topic. So how do these small scale hedgerow um, farm edges interact with that wider landscape scale um, in terms of influencing birds in the hedgerows themselves? And what you have to pay attention to here is on the, on the y-axis, we have the number of bird species in a hedgerow. And on the right here, we have the distance of that hedgerow to the nearest natural woodland. And so what we see is that Riparian areas have the most bird species, hedgerows have the next, then tree lines, then at the lowest here is bare and weedy. But if you're very close to another patch of woodland, you have the most bird species in a hedgerow. And if you're very far away from um, a patch of woodland, you're also having more species in a hedgerow. And there's kind of this little area in between where bird species richness and hedgerows are lower. And this might be where in a landscape where you want to target putting in a hedgerow, if that makes sense. So what you what birds use your hedgerow is going to depend on what the surrounding landscape looks like as well. So how important is the surrounding landscape? Super important. Okay, so let's move on. How do hedgerows influence pest reduction by birds and adjacent crops? This is um, going to imply something that we call biolog conservation biological control. So over here on the right, um, this is a, a system where a lot of this work has taken place in coffee systems in Jamaica, Africa, um, Mexico. Um, and here we have um, on the bottom coffee berries. We have the coffee berry borer beetle in the middle and those impact the coffee berries by eating them and causing damage to, to yield and crop damage. And then we have these as an example, black-throated blue warblers, which eat the coffee berry borer beetle, therefore reducing them, therefore reducing damage in the coffee. So you have this overall positive effect of the birds on the coffee, if that makes sense. So what we're asking with the hedgerows and with habitat in the natural landscape is, if we plant hedgerows or if we have more habitat in the natural landscape, or if there's something to do with a crop that we're working with, can we actually make this relationship, this top-down positive relationship from birds on the crops stronger? By having more habitat because we'll have more birds. So this is, I was interested in looking in this system in the Sacramento Valley and I worked with Rachel who you have met. She's here being very casual on a tractor. Um, <laughs> so um, I looked, I, we decided to focus in on English walnuts for a couple of reasons. Um, one where I was in California, I was at UC Davis doing my dissertation. So the US um, produces 12% of the world's walnuts and 99% of those are grown in California and in the Central Valley. So really important crop for California. Also, they take up a lot of land. So, and, and this has really increased over the last 15 years. So over the last 15 years, we've seen the thousands of acres of increases in walnuts and we've seen the orchards themselves become much more dense. So really important um, element of the landscape, especially in California. Um, we also know that one of the key pests are these codling moths, which um, when uncontrolled can cause up to 40% damage in these walnuts and it can be quite expensive for growers and for all of us really, even as consumers. So there are a couple different um, stages that the codling moth goes through. They'll start here as an adult in the spring, they'll fly, then they'll lay eggs. Um, the little larva will hatch from the eggs. They'll bore into the walnuts, rendering them unmarketable. So they've damaged the walnut at that, at that point. And then the um, larva will leave in the fall and the winter. Um, they'll build little cocoons underneath the bark flakes on the walnut trees themselves, and then or on the ground underneath the walnut trees. And then they'll um, uh, hatch the next spring to become a new adult. So I really wanted to focus in here on this wintering time period when, when the, um, the larvae don't move around, they're in cocoons, they're really susceptible to things like predation from birds. So the idea here is if, if birds are able to reduce codling moth during the winter, there won't be as many adults flying in the spring. And the reason I selected that time period also is because there's always already been a ton of research since the 50s demonstrating that birds reduce these codling moths in apple orchards, sometimes up to 97%. So I already knew that. So it kind of set the stage for me to ask, A, does this also happen in walnuts? And B, is there something we can do with the habitat on the farm to even make this a better service or a um, bigger impact on the, on the part of birds? 
So I um, selected 20 orchards and 10 of them were what we called habitat orchards. So these had either riparian areas or hedgerows on their edges and 10 of them um, were clean. So they had no hedgerows at all um, and were either bare or weedy margins. And I also um, uh, um, described the habitat in the surrounding landscape, um, basically the percentage of semi-natural habitat in the landscape. Each one of these circles demonstrates a particular hedgerow and I use GIS to categorize um, how much natural habitat was in the surrounding landscape. So I asked one, uh, so one of the first questions I want to ask before jumping into this predation question is just like, are birds using these hedgerows and these orchards in the same ways that we showed in the other study? So um, I did some bird surveys, I put out some video cameras, um, and yes, we found a lot of birds using these orchards during the winter. And I wanted to focus in specifically on the bird species that had the foraging characteristics and the habitat choices that would specifically mean that they would eat codling moths, if that makes sense. So all of these different species, there's 10 of them, are woodpeckers and nuthatches, and these are all birds that forage on tree trunks, that eat larvae, and that would specifically be targeting codling moth. And that's really important because if I just counted birds that don't actually eat codling moth, we wouldn't really see that much or that wouldn't really tell us much, right? And so for these 12 different species, we see some interesting things. This is a heat map. So anything that's dark red or orange are places where birds have, um, that particular species is most abundant. And each one of these little numbers is an individual hedgerow or, um, an inside an orchard. So for example, on one here, we have um, four species in hedgerow one on the margin transect. And then I also did a transect inside the orchard itself at that same orchard. And there, there was only one species. So overall, what this is saying is that there are more species in the hedgerows themselves than in the orchards adjacent to the hedgerows. And the orchards adjacent to the hedgerows, there are maybe three or four woodpecker species, but still quite a few. So that's kind of neat. But the hedgerows themselves really had quite a diversity of species. And, and is there a difference between whether you have a hedgerow or not? Yes, totally. So the green here are the orchards that had the hedgerows and then these tiny little orange dots are um, the orchards that had no hedgerows at all, barely, barely any birds using those at all. And inside the orchard, we see a similar pattern, not quite as strong. So 100 meters away from the hedgerow into the walnut orchard, we still had more, spe more bird species when there was a hedgerow on that orchard's edge than orchards that had no hedgerow at all. Um, but the, the relationships or the difference is a little bit muted. They're also paying attention to what's going on in the orchard and they're less influenced by the hedgerow themselves. Okay, so um, I can't actually see my clock. So how am I doing on time? Okay. <laughs> okay, great. Um, yeah, so you have, um, sorry, you have about 10 more minutes. So um, for, for the whole thing. So just okay. five minutes or so for questions. All right, I'll, I'll jam through this as quickly as I can. All right, so um, I also looked at a couple of different um, uh, habitat features on these farms and looked at the maximum number of woodpecker abundance um, because I found that woodpeckers were actually some of the primary foragers on these codling moths in the orchard. So on the top here, we just have um, whether the orchard trees themselves, what they looked like, were they tall or short, did they have a lot of bark or not? So we just found that there were more woodpeckers in the orchards when the trees were tall, the walnut trees were taller, when they were bigger, and then they had deeper fissures in the bark, or basically if they were an older orchard. Second, there were more woodpeckers in the orchard if there was more cover in the natural landscape surrounding the, surrounding the farm. And then finally, the characteristics of the, of the hedgerow itself was important. So there were more woodpeckers in orchards when there was a hedgerow on the edge that was taller, that had more layers, and it was whiter. It's so basically habitat, the better. So does habitat on farms like hedgerows provide habitat for birds? Absolutely. How important are the crop characteristics? Totally important. And three, how important is the surrounding landscape? Super duper important. So how does this, how do these same questions, um, how can we answer these same questions when we're just looking at pest predation by birds? So to answer this question, I procured 2,000 codling moth larvae from the Agricultural Institute uh, Research Station in Parlier, California. And the really generous farmers who trusted me dearly apparently let me glue these live codling moths to their trees. So um, in these same 20 orchards, I glued 100 codling moths on the trees of each orchard ages, which would keep birds from being able to eat those larvae. And on half of them, I left them open. So in other words, I was able to compare the predation rates between the larva to which birds had access and the larva to which birds were um, not able to have access because of these, these cages. And so I looked 
at these throughout the winter. Um, I also looked at a couple. So the main questions I had were, what was the influence of the cage? What was influence of whether it had, a, you know, would predation be different if there was a hedgerow or not a hedgerow? Would predation be different if the larvae were on the orchard edge versus inside the orchard further away from the hedgerow? Would they be influenced by the amount of semi-natural cover in the landscape? And then there was another factor I used that sort of determined whether birds ate a bunch of larvae on the same tree or not, which we don't have to get into. Uh, so first question, cages made a big difference. So when birds had access to those larvae, they predated larvae up to up to as high as 75%, whereas the caged um, larvae showed very small amount of predation. And those were mainly like lacewings and spiders and those sorts of things. So birds had a huge impact on the predation of these, lar of these codling moth larvae. And here's just, I'm going to go really quickly and show you um, our two favorite species. This is a, a Nuttles woodpecker on the left foraging one of our codling moth. And here is a white-breasted nuthatch on the right also foraging on these codling moth that I put out. The one on the left is it's gonna get one, I promise. Oh, you can see it. You just saw the white the white-breasted nut hatch just snacked on a little codling moth larvae. Oh, there it goes. I love these guys. I could watch this all day long. <laughs> okay, so then we looked at the surrounding landscape and we found a couple things. One, simply having a hedgerow on the edge of the edge of your orchard actually wasn't very effective at increasing predation. That was something we were surprised with. What was more important was the amount of natural landscape or semi-natural habitat in the surrounding landscape. So here in the green, we have the larva to which the birds had access. In the orange, we have the caged larva. And this just shows that for those larva to which the birds had access, the more natural habitat you had in the landscape, including hedgerows, um, the more predation you saw. So, do habitats on farms like hedgerows improve pest control by birds in adjacent crops? Sort of. I mean, they increase the number of birds, but maybe not directly predation. How important is the surrounding landscape? Super duper important. Okay, then I also looked at just the larvae that were uncaged. So just the larvae to which birds had access. I asked all those same questions. I also asked a couple other things like, do things like how the walnut tree, what are the characteristics of the walnut trees and does that influence um, predation? And sure enough, it really did. It had a strong effect. So. Um, this is predation on the left, and larvae were more predated on walnut trees that were taller, had a larger DBH, or were wider, and that had deeper fissures. So, for example, this is smooth bark on the left and really rough bark on the right, and there was much more predation in these wa older walnut orchards. So, do habitats on farms like hedgerows improve pest reduction by birds and adjacent crops? Sort of. How important are the crop characteristics? Super duper important. Okay, and how important is landscape? Also very, very important. So in short, more local and landscape habitat equals more avian predators. More predators equals more predation of codling moth larvae, especially in those cleared landscapes. I didn't get into that. Uh, more landscape habitat means you have more avian predators and more predation of the codling moth. And the bigger, older trees you have on your farm means you're gonna have more predation, more predators, especially in landscapes that maybe are more simplified. All right, I had to rush through those last couple slides, but um, I'm open for questions if we have time. Yeah, thank you so much, Sasha. That was really, really great. Um, we, we do have about five minutes for questions. Um, I don't see any in the, oh, um, no, just a comment. Amazing talk and research, thank you. Um, if anybody has any questions though, please feel free to put them in the comment box. You might wanna check um, okay. uh, the comment box too, or chat box. Um, if I got anything directly. Yeah. Um, um, Sasha, I have a yeah. question. Um, have you, uh, or do you know of any growers that put up nest boxes, say, for the white-breasted nuthatch? Mm, that's a good question. I actually don't know anybody that's put out boxes for white-breasted nuthatches. And um, that's a really good idea because, yes, they are cavity nesters, as are nettles woodpeckers. I actually don't know um, how successful either of those species are um, or how much they occupy boxes. I don't think Nuttles woodpeckers will use boxes actually, but do you, have you seen anything about white-breasted nut hatches? Well, I think um, one of our earlier speakers, Melanie Truen, who has 200 oh, nest yeah. boxes along the Puda Creek corridor has some number of them occupied by white-breasted nut hatches. And I bet you some of those maybe near walnut orchards because she's right in this area where you studied. So- um, Yeah, yeah, she was right right along um, Puda Creek. 
where I had several orchards. Yeah, so um, I think one of the differences between something like a bluebird, which really occupy boxes and are really helpful for vineyards and that sort of thing, um, is white-breasted nuthatches tend to need, be not as, they don't flock, right? So they hang out mostly in like little groups or with other foraging flocks. And so I think they're less abundant. So they might not, if you put out a hundred boxes, you might not get, you won't get like a hundred white-breasted nuthatches. But if you put out bluebird boxes, which is the same size as the nuthatch, you're going to get a couple of nuthatches and those are going to be super beneficial. I mean, we had like in some orchards, very few nuthatches, like one or two even, and they just snacked. Like they, they removed all of the, of the codling moths and I got videos of them. I could see their little like tiny needle piercings into it. And, you know, Rachel and you both just showed videos showing, um, uh, natural, uh, or not, you know, uh, white breasted hatches foraging up and down the tree, looking in all the bark crevices. That's exactly what they're doing to look for those codling moths. So we got to give mad respect to those white, white breasted nut hatches for sure. <laughs> yeah, it's a good point. I want to look more into that actually, sort of what can we do artificially to attract nut hatches. But what we do know is that they're attracted to oaks and larger, older trees. So if you um, make sure that when, one of the points I was trying to make with looking at both the, um, the crop and the surrounding landscape and the hedgerow is let's say you have an orchard you're going to want to bring in birds that forage in trees right so you probably might maybe don't want to put like a grassland hedgerow on your edge you maybe want to bring in oaks or bigger trees into your um, hedgerow because then you're going to attract woodpeckers and white-breasted nuthatches and all those things that actually eat stuff that's on trees if that makes sense mm -hmm. totally does yeah Sasha, we have another question um, that came in. Um, this person lives in walnut country and is wondering about predation rates when commercial walnut crops are so heavily sprayed. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a lot of woodpeckers and magpies around and also hearing a lot about West Nile regarding the loss of our birds. Is there any knowledge on the impacts regarding these two issues? Yeah, sure. So. Um... I actually did get to talk about this, but um, yeah, pesticides are a huge issue. And so this is why we are trying to, um, you know, recommend that we try to utilize habitat whenever possible. I know often you cannot get rid of pesticides entirely if you're a conventional orchard, but having habitat on your orchard, I think will, we are demonstrating will actually reduce your need to spray as often. Um, there has been a lot of research on um, spray effects on raptors in orchards and, um, Definitely, um, we know for a fact that pesticides harm birds. They remove their um, insect prey. Um, they're damaging to individuals themselves. But um, in terms of it affecting the ability of the bird to predate on the codling moth larva, I definitely, I looked actually, I, I worked in mostly conventional orchards. And so um, I actually looked at the amount that the growers put on their orchards the year before, the winter before, and to see if there was any relationship between the amount sprayed and both the codling, natural codling moth um, densities and also the effects of the predation by the birds and actually didn't find a strong relationship. So um, that's a really difficult one to measure. So we'll see. Um, the second question is West Nile virus. Yeah, so West Nile virus especially impacts, as you pointed out, um, woodpeckers and uh, co uh, corvids. So um, magpies, jays, those sorts of things have a lot of issues with West Nile. And if we're, if we're losing birds to, due to West Nile virus, we're going to see, you know, their services, we're not going to see their services as much in the agricultural landscape. So, you know, that issue is pretty much out of the control of a grower, um, pesticides more in the control of a grower. Great. Thank you so much, Sasha. I think um, that's uh, our, all we have time for you. We're going to move okay. on now to Kara, um, who is going to share her screen and, and talk about um, and give her presentation. So thank you so much, Sasha. Hey, great. Thank you. Let me get to the share screen, please. And that you can all hear me and see me, yes, before I, once I go into the slideshow mode, I won't be able to see you. Yep. Oh, yes, I can. Never mind. I can actually. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Give me just a second here. Yeah. Set this up. All right. Well, this has been a really informational morning. I'm hoping that most of you that are watching are feeling the same 
way. And I'm really appreciative to Wild Farm Alliance for, for putting this on and figuring out how to navigate the field days in our COVID area where we are. I was wondering what this would be like. And it's it's pretty cool. You know, we're we're all probably more of us than might be able to make it um, are here just because of travel and things. So it's it's really great. And I'm getting to hear a lot of cool stuff. Um, obviously, Sasha in Missouri may not be able to make it out here to California to Davis Home Ranch. Who knows? But I'm very appreciative and I've really enjoyed hearing um, everyone else's work. And I think that what I have to say will um, be uh, a compliment to what everyone else has shared. So today I'm going to be talking to you about healthy soils and beneficial birds. And, um, you know, first talk a little bit about, um, you know, what why we care about healthy soils and um, how healthy soils help attract beneficial birds and um, what are some of the services provided by birds. So you've heard a lot about that already and I'm not gonna go into a ton of depth because you've heard so much great stuff, but I am gonna provide a few examples and then give you a couple of options for how you can implement healthy soils practices on your farm. If of course you are here in California, I apologize um, to those of you who are not. So let's see. Okay, great. It advances very easily too. So just to give a little introduction to Audubon and Audubon, California. I work at Audubon, California, which is a state office of the, Na the National Audubon Society, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. Our mission is to restore and conserve natural ecosystems focusing on birds, other wildlife, and their habitats for the benefit of humanity and for the Earth's biological diversity. So that's a pretty meaty mission statement. And you know, as an organization with um, a national office that's based in New York and DC with 20 some odd state offices, and then we have independent chapters as well, we are doing things that, um, that relate to this mission. And because we are a fairly large organization that has those different um, national and state and local structures, we have a set of strategic priorities that we work on. And there are five of those priorities, including coasts, working lands, water, bird-friendly communities, and climate. So today I'm gonna to be focusing mainly here, let's see, can you see my mouse now? Um, on the working lands. And that's really where I have focused my work. And here in the Central Valley is mostly where our state office uh, focuses on working lands, although there are, other, there are other areas in the state that are producing crops. We have focused our um, project portfolio here in the Central Valley. And my work in the last 10 years or so has really been, um, I've had a big focus on rice um, and worked a lot with the rice growing community. I'm usually up here talking about, or up here or on screen, or however you wanna talk about where I am right now, talking about um, water birds and wetland habitat. And I know um, Emily mentioned in the beginning, I might be talking about that uh, um, bird returns program, but I'm not, I'm gonna talk a little bit about a different program and, and I'll show that to you and some other things that we're doing. So, for working lands, we're going to overlap just a little bit with climate, but it's all going to be mainly focused uh, about working uh, on, on working lands. And, um, you know, how I've been pulling in some of this healthy soils work and how it contributes um, and why it's important to birds. So for any of us that have been in California, it's no secret that the Central Valley has lost much of the natural habitat that was once occurring whether that was wetland habitat, riparian habitat, or grassland habitat. Um, again, I'm usually talking about wetland habitat, but you can see by this map, um, the, this really light blue line that kind of gets covered over by the, the green, but still should be going all the way down the valley is our riparian habitat. And um, we can see how much of that has been lost on this right-hand image. So, you know, whatever habitat we are talking about, whether it's riparian or grassland or other sort of upland habitats, we've lost a lot of that. And it's because as most people have talked about already, we have this really incredible fertile soil in the Central Valley that is producing 
you know, 25% of the nation's fruits, of, fruits and vegetables. And as Sasha pointed out, 99% of all the walnuts that are produced in the US and similar for almonds. So there's a whole lot going on in the Central Valley. And um, we also wanna make sure that our birds still have habitat. Um, and, and given what we see here with the landscape, it's not surprising that in North America, um, one in four birds have been lost in the last 50 years. This was a study that was um, published in Science. I believe this was in 2019. The years have gotten a little murky, everyone, with COVID. So I think it was 2019 that this study came out. I'm sorry I don't have a citation for it. But it is um, quite a few birds. And different bird guilds, you know, water birds versus forest birds versus grassland birds have different rates of decline. But it's not surprising, you know, what's happening in California is, is not unique, right? It's happening in other places as well. So, <clears throat> um, what's interesting is that the Central Valley is still a hotspot for migratory land birds. So this was a study that was released by Audubon's national science team. This actually did come out last year and it's showing how important the Central Valley is for migratory land birds. So the image on the right hand side of your screen shows the different um, parts of the Central Valley starting up north with the Sacramento Valley. Um, these different basins as we call them, these are really good basins for planning purposes for folks like me who are working on on the ground planning and conservation in the Central Valley. We break it up into these four parts, the Sacramento Valley, which is where um, you know Rachel was talking about and that's where Davis Home Ranch is. Then there's the Yolo Delta Basin, the San Joaquin Basin, and then the Tulare Basin. And those bars that are raising up above are showing the millions of birds that pass through. The dark blue is in spring and the light blue is in fall. So despite how dramatically the landscapes have changed, this study is showing that birds rely on the resources that remain along the river corridors, the birds are relying on the resources that everyone has shown you so far in the hedgerows. Um, it's super, super important. Um, and we're hoping that work like this can show us more where to put these, um, these types of habitats. So in the four Central Valley regions, collectively, there are about 65 million migratory land birds in the spring that were hosted and 48 million in the fall. And if you're curious about how this was done, this um, data was taken from the very popular eBird um, platform that allows uh, people to go out and note where they see birds. And there was a modeling exercise developed um, with a partners in flight um, that allowed the um, national science team to estimate the total birds. So it's a really fantastic thing to see that birds are still using um, the Central Valley habitat. So, and it's my job as a conservationist to add habitat back on the landscape where it's possible, which brings me to the healthy soils. And you might be wondering, you know, why do we care about healthy soils? And we care, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna get there and I'm gonna start by telling you that the state has this incredibly ambitious uh, climate goal to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions to 40% below 1990 levels by 2083. So this has all started um, with a number of different policy measures with AB 32 back in 2006, where we uh, set a greenhouse gas reduction target to just 1990 levels by 2020. And these more ambitious uh, goal of 40% below 1990 levels was set by uh, Governor Brown before he left office. What's important about this is that natural and working lands are poised to be part of the climate solution. And so when I say natural and working lands, I'm talking about rangelands, I'm talking about forests, woodlands, I'm even talking about westland, wetlands and coastal areas, grasslands, shrublands, importantly, farmland, riparian areas and urban green spaces. So there is a natural and working lands climate implementation plan that was released. And that has goals for increasing the rate of state-funded soil conservation practices and also increasing the rate of state-funded oak, woodland, and riparian reforestation um, in, in addition to other practices. So we're getting closer here. We want to be 
you know, increasing these soil conservation practices and riparian and oak woodland um, restoration. So as part of this effort, there was a Healthy Soils Initiative that was um, started in 2017. And this is a collaboration of state agencies and departments that promote these healthy soil practices on farmlands and ranch lands. And there's a couple, there's an objective of the Healthy Soils Program, which is to goes right along with the Natural and Working Lands Initiative, which is to increase the statewide implementation of conservation management practices that improve soil health, sequester carbon, and reduce the atmospheric greenhouse gas um, emissions. And they do this in three ways. One is providing uh, financial incentive to California farmers and ranchers for agricultural management that sequester carbon and reduce the greenhouse gases. They also fund on-farm demonstration projects that collect data that showcase these conservation practices in action. And then they create a platform for promoting the widespread adoption of conservation and management of these practices throughout the state. So the things that we are talking about here today are many of the practices that are included. The healthy soils practices are actually broken down into three main agricultural types. There's cropland uh, practices you can implement on your cropland, practices you can implement on your orchards or vineyards, and then finally practices that you can implement on your rangeland. The cropland suite of practices actually hosts 23 different practices. There's 11 practices that are applicable to orchards and vineyards and eight that are applicable to rangelands. And I'm not going to go into all of these, but what is really important is that the things that we're talking about today, we've heard people mention cover crops, we've heard people uh, mention hedgerows, uh, conservation cover, riparian restoration. These are all what I call bird friendly healthy soils practices. These are practices that are being offered through these programs that are good for um, the Healthy Soils Initiative that contribute to the state's greenhouse gas emission goals and that are also good for bringing in our beneficial birds. So some of the benefits of healthy, soil pra healthy soils practices, um, Rachel mentioned some of these earlier just in terms of what are the benefits of hedgerows. Since hedgerows are a healthy soils practice, there's a lot of overlap here and I haven't given as comprehensive of a list. I've just uh, I'm talking about a few specific practices. One, they attract beneficial birds. Two, um, they are important for water infiltration. Three, they are important for carbon sequestration, which is what um, helps them uh, work toward the state's uh, climate goals. And then lastly, they also help with erosion reduction. So improvements in water quality come from that erosion reduction and also from the water infiltration. When we get less water running off, when we have vegetation on a bank or somewhere along the edge of a field, when water runs off, it is slowed and it's, also, it's slowed by the vegetation and it also has a chance to infiltrate down. So um, the roots aerate the soil, they improve the water infiltration, the, just the whole soil profile and soil health is improved. Rachel mentioned how there's so much going on below ground that we can't see. We can't even see it with our naked eye if we pick up the soil, right? Um, but we, there are a ton of different benefits that can, can come from this. And when we slow down that water movement, one of the other things that we can get is some groundwater recharge. So just to mention too, uh, Emily showed a picture like this earlier. This is their um, riparian, the very young stage of their riparian restoration um, at their, um, I forget the actual location of it, but I'll show it to you in just a second. So as an example of the nutrient filtration of a hedgerow and a healthy soils practice, um, Audubon with different partners, Sasha, I believe mentioned this practice and Rachel as well, um, initiated this practice in 2012 and 2013 to look at hedgerows across Leolo and Solano County and to look at not only the bird use, but also the soil nitrate concentration. So we went out to all these different hedgerows. The pink hedgerows were, um, he I'm sorry, we went out to these different farm fields. The farm fields with the pink lines had weedy edges and the farm fields uh, with the green lines had hedgerows along 
um, those um, field edges. And it was those uh, field edges with the hedgerows that had that you can see on the figure on the right had um, significantly reduced uh, nitrate concentrations. Um, and that was a really important benefit of having hedgerows um, on your farm. The other really important thing that I think other folks have talked about as well is that we see a dramatic increase in the bird species and just bird use of these hedgerows. So the bird species richness, this is the number of different species of birds that are using a hedgerow in, I'm sorry, using the edge of a farm field. I'm, I keep saying hedgerow and I mean a farm field. The bird species richness along a farm field with a hedgerow increased by 30% when there's a hedgerow present compared to when there was just a weedy field edge. Bird abundance, just the sheer number of birds increased by 40% around farm fields that had a hedgerow versus um, farm fields that did not. Native vegetation in a hedgerow increased the insectivorous birds by 60%, just like this uh, blue bird that you see here and we've noted and I will show you some additional examples of some of the um, ways that birds provide services. And then finally, that native vegetation also increased raptors by 130%. And someone, I don't remember which presentation was, showed just how um, important raptors, I think it was Sasha was showing some pictures of the, of the, the um, predation of raptors and these insectivorous birds and how they can provide those services. So if we look around the Central Valley in general, so these all these little red lines that I'm showing you here, this is the Central Valley. These are all of the water delivery canals. These are all of the aqueducts. This is like all the potential that we have in the Central Valley for adding back some habitat, whether it's a hedgerow, whether it's a filter strip, whether it's riparian, whether it's some sort of conservation cover or upland habitat, we have so much potential and imagine the number of birds that we could bring back. And when I say birds, I am referring to the beneficial birds in particular. So there's a lot of potential in the Central Valley. And as uh, one of our late partners said, every farm has a parcel that can be restored to natural habitat. Emily showed you a different version of this figure earlier in her presentation, and you can see all the different places at Davis Home Ranch just around the farm headquarters that where they have implemented um, these different kinds of habitat, riparian restoration, this area over here, the light green is the picture I showed you earlier, you know, the hedgerows, it all comes together, you know, when you piece and start things together and every farm has some unproductive area and every farm has farm edges or canal edges that can be restored to natural habitat and improve that habitat connectivity. So Davis Ranches has implemented a number of these different um, practices and I just want to end by sharing some um, some examples of the services provided by birds. Uh, Sasha gave a much longer list. I'm going to be focusing on um, just talking about some of the pest control services that birds can provide. Um, there, there's just a whole, you know, pest, I think it's easy to talk about pest control services um, because it's more of a quantifiable um, but we also just really like to, to look at birds and see birds on our property and see the biodiversity. Um, but let's look at some of the examples that I have for you um, and just some of the cool birds that are that show up at Davis Ranches from that beautiful mural on their farm. So um, blackbirds. I know blackbirds can be considered a pest by a lot of farmers. Um, however, at a conservative estimate, 75% of a tricolored blackbird's diet consists of insects. So whether it's a tricolored blackbird or maybe what you see more commonly up here is a red-winged blackbird, they are consuming a lot of different insect pests. And um, a study that was done found that the injurious insects compared to the beneficial insects, there were 16 to one of the pest insects consumed to every one beneficial insect. And um, blackbirds and other birds, as Rachel mentioned, are um, feeding their young um, 
more insects in the spring and they're consuming more insects in the spring because that's when their diets, they're feeding the, the insects to their young. So blackbirds, um, they feast on several different types of pests, weevils, cutworms, alfalfa loopers, and flies. Um, and they, whoops, will be attracted to um, blackberry and different rose hedgerows around a farm. Another example that's been brought up already are herons and egrets. And this is some information from a pilot study that was conducted by Sarah Cross, who I know many on this call know. Um, they provide valuable services in alfalfa and other places. They, Sarah and her team looked at bird counts and performed bird counts. And they found that herons and egrets on average consumed 2.2 rodents for every five minute observation. And the maximum number of rodents was 20 rodents in five minutes. So huge, huge service here that um, herons and egrets are providing. And then my final example is um, coming up and, and it's uh, looking at something similar to what Sasha did. And actually Sasha put together this literature review for Audubon, California, looking at uh, bird use of almond orchards and other nut tree crops. And similar to what she showed in Walnut Orchard, their uh, birds are um, great predators of the navel um, orange worm um, that is harbored in mummy nuts. And so birds are um, using and uh, helping that pest control by um, basically removing anywhere from two to 96% of the mummy nuts. And um, that it was higher on orchard edges than it was in the interior. But in, interestingly, the, um, the bird use and the depredation of these uh, navel orange worms was positively correlated with the number of plant species in the orchard understory and with the proportion of the habitat within one kilometer of uh, the orchards, which Sasha also shared with us as well. So I just want to um, leave you with a couple of ways that you can, um, a couple of resources for you as a landowner, as a farmer, you can get involved with the Healthy Soils Program, which is sponsored uh, through the Department of Food and Agriculture. There is an incentive program that is available directly to landowners and producers to um, implement these healthy soils practices that also help birds on your land. Um, so this is a link to their website. They have an incentive program um, every year and it has gotten pretty great reviews from the landowners that have used it. And then finally, I just wanna leave you with also an opportunity to be part of a local regional conservation program with the rice community that we have going on today. I mentioned a lot of my work has been in rice in our next program, we have added a couple of new um, program elements that include the um, implementation of a cover crop and also the implementation of conservation cover, which is more or less the implementation of upland, some upland habitat in grasses and forbs as well. Also very good for birds. So those are just a couple of the ways that you can get involved and if you have any questions, I will take those from you now. Thank you so much, Kara. That was really, really great. Um, a lot of really um, important information that you shared. Thank you. Um, I don't see any questions directly in the chat box to me uh, or to the whole group. Um, you might wanna check to see if there's any that were sent to you um, directly. But if anybody has any questions, um, I think we have a minute or two. Um, oh, someone asked, what are mummy nuts? Right. So the, oops, where am I here? You can still, whoops, let's not go backwards. <laughs> I'm moving things here on my screen, apologies, when I was trying to look for the, um, for the chat box. Um, so the mummy nuts, um, these are nuts that are left on the tree after harvest and they harbor this navel orange worm, which uh, the, the um, 
the larvae grow in those mummy nuts. And then if they're left in the orchard, the adults grow up, right? And then there's, uh, there's um, crop damage when those are left in the orchard after harvest. So the mummy nut is the actual thing that's, that's left over. Great, thanks. Well, I think um, if anybody has any questions, we, we do actually have to move on um, because of timing, but um, Kara, maybe you can just uh, hang out in the chat box and see if there's any questions and try and answer, answer yeah. them through that. Um, but now uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Megan, um, who's gonna um, lead with the, with the final presentation of the day. All right, thanks so much. Um, let me share my screen. Sorry about that. One more second. Oh. All right, everyone able to see my screen and hear me? Great, thank you so much. All right, so um, I'm Megan. I'm currently um, working as a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Illinois at Chicago, uh, but I've been interested in studying birds in agriculture for quite a while now. Um, and I've looked at a variety of different agricultural systems, including the California organic farms um, that I'm gonna be talking about today. I've also done some work looking at birds on coffee farms in Kenya. Um, and then most recently, my research has been focused on on birds in these vast corn and soybean fields in the Midwest of the United States. Um, so I am in Illinois and that, that's the system that I've been looking at. Um, I'm not really gonna be talking about that today, but if you have questions, I'd be happy to, um, to talk with you more about that. So we have heard um, about the, all of the benefits of hedgerows a lot today, which has been awesome. Um, and I wanted to share an experiment that I conducted to study um, the effects of the habitat surrounding a field on the pest control services that are provided by birds, um, specifically in row crop agriculture. So there's gonna be a lot of overlap with some of the things that Sasha talked about, um, but this is sort of a different study system as well. So when I was designing this experiment, which was a while ago now, um, a lot of the, or most of the previous research that had been done um, looking at pest control by birds in agriculture was done in agricultural systems that have more vertical structure um, than row crops. So places like coffee farms, vineyards, um, and the orchards that we'd heard about in Sasha's work. Um, these uh, types of agriculture that have a lot of vertical structure are great places to find birds because birds tend to like um, that vertical structure. Um, so the structure of, um, excuse me, of the crops themselves will affect the bird activity that we can expect to see. So for instance, we probably won't expect to see a woodpecker um, down in low growing row crops uh, because they tend to specialize on trees. So um, because row crops are so widely grown, I was interested in learning more about the services that we might expect to see by birds in these lower growing crops. Um, could we expect to see the same services that birds had been already shown to provide um, in these taller crops in low row crops as well? So this photo was provided by Emily um, of a hedgerow at Davis Ranches. Um, this is a pretty standard field next to this really beautiful shrubby hedgerow. And this is exactly this type of row crop system that I was interested in studying. Um, I wanted to know what local scale, so what really small scale variables affected the probability within a farm that a bird could provide pest control. And um, I, so I should mention here that when I say pest control in this talk, I'm really only going to be focusing on arthropod or insect pest control. Um, although, as was mentioned a couple times before, we know that birds like raptors can provide control of small mammals um, and even other nuisance birds as well. 
So when we study bird pest control, there are a lot of questions that we can ask about the relationship between birds and habitat. First, we can ask if farms with hedgerows have more birds. We've heard um, a lot about that today. And I think that we can, in most cases, say yes. So that's going to be definitely a win for the birds. Um, we can ask, does having more birds mean that we're necessarily going to have more pest control? And I think this is sometimes going to be the case, but not in every situation. But then finally, we can just directly ask whether the hedgerow presence is actually going to increase the pest control services and not just have the increase the number of birds on the farm. So this was the specific question that I wanted to answer um, because I thought it would be useful information for farmers to have. Um, while we might assume that bringing birds to the farm increases pest control, I wanted a way to um, scientifically test this question. Um, so that's what I'm going to be talking about today. And I'm going to go into some of the, um, the details of this experiment. Um, so I conducted this experiment in all the way back in 2012. Um, in Humboldt County in Northern California. Um, this was part of my master's research uh, project at Humboldt State University. And so I conducted um, research on 29 organic farms. Um, you can see a map of where they were located here. So the inset map shows us where we are in California, um, all the way up in Northern California, Humboldt County. Um, the farms were spread out uh, across uh, the, this area in Humboldt County. So you can see that some of them were closer um, to, to the coast and then some of them were about two hours drive inland as well. And, and they all had um, multiple different types of crops being grown. Um, they sold in multiple different outlets, including um, most of them directly uh, to consumers at farmers markets, which is where I initially made contact with a lot of these farmers. So these are just a couple pictures of some of the farms where I did this research. Um, you can see they varied quite a bit in size um, and other different characteristics as well. But overall, I did find high bird diversity on and around the farms. Um, so across all of the farms, I detected 105 different bird species. Um, and of those 105, 60 were detected using the either the row crop or the hedgerow habitat. So that would exclude birds that were just flying over. Um, or things that were seen at a distance. So 105 different, uh, or sorry, 60 bird species actually using these farm habitats um, with an average of around 19 bird species per farm. So I decided to focus this study on kale crops. Um, so kale, of course, is a specialty crop. Uh, it's grown pretty widely in the area where I was conducting the study, and it was grown on many of the farms that I was working at. Um, so one reason that I decided to work with kale crops is because it's a, it's a row crop, but like other brassica crops, it can be susceptible to quite a few different caterpillar pests. Um, and caterpillars, of course, are great food for birds. So they provide this nice, tidy little package of protein. And during the nesting season, it's easy to deliver that um, to the nestlings. It's, it's basically a high quality food for birds. So I wanted to simulate what birds might do with a caterpillar uh, pest outbreak in this type of system. All right, so again, I'm gonna go into some of the details of how exactly I conducted this experiment, just because I think it can be fun to see some of the really weird stuff that we do in the name of science. Um, so I wanted to create a fairly realistic way to simulate caterpillar pest outbreaks on the farms. Um, and what I came up with was a sentinel pest presentation station. That's a lot of words, but basically I took a lacinato kale leaf or a dinosaur kale leaf. Um, I stuck it in one of these floral water picks to keep it fresh. And then we went out and placed those picks um, on the ground uh, at the farms. And then I used an adhesive, of course, that's safe for birds to attach to cabbage looper caterpillars to the kale leaves. So you can see in this inset uh, sort of what that looks like. Um, and then we placed these sentinel pest presentation stations out at the farms before dawn. And then we returned about seven hours later to see what had been eaten. Um, and then if at least one caterpillar had been consumed, we considered that a depredation and we recorded that. Although, and I think, every situation, um, we never had one caterpillar removed. So if a bird had found it, um, they were gonna eat both caterpillars. 
All right, so I threw this photo in just to show that I could not have done this weird science stuff without the help of quite a few people. Um, so we actually had to prepare each of these kale leaf stations uh, the night before we set them out so that they didn't wilt and so the caterpillars uh, would stay fresh. Um, so that meant some really long nights before getting up at dawn, um, gluing caterpillars to kale leaves. And we placed 20 of these presentation stations on each of the farms in a grid. Um, so the grid was located close to one of the field edges near some sort of natural habitat. Um, and then we also placed motion activated cameras at some of the stations so we could see what species were eating the caterpillars. So these are just some pictures so you can see what some of these stations looked like um, when they were placed either with or without a camera nearby. So I mentioned before that a lot of these farms um, were fairly small and they grew multiple different crop types. So that grid of these presentation stations that we placed was often spread across multiple different crops being grown on a single farm. And you can see that here in some of these pictures. So for instance, we've got these um, presentation stations at the top uh, that are located near strawberry crops, for instance. And then down here, you can see what that camera setup looked like. And then at each of these different stations on a farm, we measured the distance to the nearest uncultivated habitat. So the nearest thing that just was not um, being cultivated, um, the dominant type of that habitat. So whether it was grass, um, tree, shrub, or something that was human made like a building. And then we measured what the surrounding crop type was around that individual uh, sentinel pest station. All right, so this is the part where we get to watch cute videos of birds eating caterpillars, or at least I think they're pretty cute. Um, we've got this robin here and you can see that it's eating the caterpillars off of this pest leaf uh, or this uh, sentinel pest leaf. Um, and so what we found was between zero and 80% of these stations on a given farm were depredated with an average of 24% of them having uh, been depredated. And we've got another little video of a robin here. Um, so we had 116 video samples and of those videos, 10 showed robins consuming the caterpillars, four showed scrub jays and one actually showed a starling. Um, I do, however, think it's likely that there were more species of birds that were consuming the caterpillars, but we just didn't catch them on camera for whatever reason. Um, so if you remember, we only had a couple of cameras out per farm. Um, we weren't monitoring each one of those stations. All right, this video does not show a bird, but I actually think it's really cute. What we're looking at here is a little tiny lizard that is trying to pull off a caterpillar and it's failing. So he's located just right on top of um, that leaf. Uh, it's a little bit um, backlit, so it's hard to see. Uh, this was actually part of a series of several videos um, where he continues to struggle to pull off this caterpillar and, and fails and eventually gives up and leaves. Um, so from videos like this, but also from direct observations, we were able to determine that all of the caterpillars that uh, were removed from these presentation stations were uh, removed by birds. And then finally, I'm just showing this one because it's actually my favorite video. We've got a scrub jay here, um, which is getting one of these caterpillars. Um, so it pulls the caterpillar. drops it and then just regurgitates a whole big glob of caterpillars. Um, so what we can see here is that this bird had likely been going to a couple of the stations already and collecting caterpillars. It eats that first caterpillar and then it just picks up and eats that whole big regurgitated glob for whatever reason. So we found that there were two categories of variables that significantly predicted the probability that a sentinel pest was consumed um, by birds. So first, the surrounding crop type where the sentinel pest was placed was important. 
pests that were placed among brassica crops, like in the top picture you can see with the robin, were significantly more likely to be depredated than those that were placed among other crop types. Um, like for instance, in the picture in the bottom where we've got the um, pests placed among strawberries. So this is likely just due to the study design. So I was using these brassica uh, pests on brassica leaves. So the birds might just have a better search image among brassica crops um, for the caterpillars than among crops where they might not normally be found. This finding isn't necessarily relevant to farmers because you're probably or hopefully not out there actually placing pests on your own farms. Um, however, I do think it is really interesting because if the birds already have potentially already have a search image, that means they're probably already out there looking for these caterpillars in the brassica crops. Um, so my second finding was that the local habitat, so right, the habitat right at the edges of the farms does significantly affect the probability of depredation by birds. So this is um, actually in contrast to um, some of the findings that Sasha was talking about, um, where she, she did not find that that local, there was an effect of that local scale variable of the habitat right at the edge of the farm. Um, and this picture is just showing a uh, native hedgerow that was planted on deep seated farm, which is one of the farms where I did, um, did my study. So first I found that the probability that one of those sentinel pest stations was depredated was highest when the closest uncultivated habitat uh, was a shrub. So the probability when the category was grass or tree or building or man-made um, was, was lower than for the shrub category. Um, but grass and tree and then the, the third building category, they, the probability wasn't statistically different um, from each other for those categories. It was, however, statistically higher um, probability if the category was shrub um, that the, the pest was more likely to be depredated. And then I also found that there was a distance effect. So at those stations that were closer to the field edge had a higher probability of depredation. Um, again, with those stations uh, that were closer to shrub showing higher probabilities of depredation than those near other habitat categories. So what we're looking at for this graph here along the horizontal axis, we're just, axis, we're just seeing increasing distance to uncultivated habitat. And then we've got the probability that a sentinel pest station would be eaten along the, um, the vertical axis, axis there. Um, so I should note, however, that many of these sites may have had hedgerows that included both shrubs and trees. For this study, I was only measuring what was uh, absolutely closest to that sentinel pest presentation station. So these results are not suggesting that having trees is going to decrease the probability of depredation. Um, it's only that in this system, having shrubs nearby was correlated with increased bird predation activity. So we know, and we've heard a lot today about how hedgerows are beneficial for birds and contribute to bird conservation. Uh, the study that I conducted showed that shrubby hedgerows also have the potential to ben benefit farmers as well by increasing these pest control services provided by birds. Um, and because the distance from hedgerow also plays a role, we might expect that some of these smaller farms or farms with multiple smaller fields that are broken up by hedgerows might benefit more from pest removal by birds. Um, and the study was only focused on the very local, very small scale variables that could affect pest consumption by birds. So I was really interested in the things that farmers could affect directly, like for instance, planting hedgerows. Um, obviously, I've, as we've heard before, um, especially in Sasha's work, the surrounding landscape at a much larger scale is also going to play a role, but I did not examine that here. And so one th other thing to note is that this experiment was meant to replicate a pest outbreak with a higher pest density. I actually did conduct a companion study uh, to this one where um, I went to a small subset of those farms and I placed cages over kale plants 
Um, and those cages were meant to keep the birds off so that I could compare the crop yield of, uh, of kale crops where the birds could access to the crop yield of crop of crops that were control plots that were uncaged. Um, and uh, so what I found was there was no actual difference in the crop yield between these caged and uncaged plants, suggesting that at least um, in this small subset of farms growing kale, birds were not providing a significant measurable service in terms of crop yield. Um, However, we measured the caterpillar uh, pest densities at the beginning of this experiment, and they were extremely low at the time. Um, so it makes sense that if there weren't that many pests for birds to consume, then we wouldn't necessarily see a difference there. So are birds still important, even if we don't see a measurable, uh, measurable services in a low pest density year? I would argue that yes, um, having birds to help protect against outbreaks is going to help just provide resiliency on the farm. So remember that the sentinel pest experiment um, that I uh, did took place over a very short time period, only seven hours. Um, and I think the magnitude of the bird response, so with up to 80% of the sentinel pests being eaten within a such a short period of time um, really suggests just how important birds can be in the face of potential outbreaks. And then finally, I wanted to just briefly talk about the types of natural habitat that surround a farm. So in this study, I found that shrubs along the field margin um, were the best predictor of depredation, better even than trees. Uh, but this is certainly not always going to be the case. So for instance, trees might be more important than shrubs when we're trying to convince birds to forage in systems with trees like orchards, for instance. Um, but my most recent research, as I mentioned briefly before, um, in these corn and soybean fields uh, in the Midwest. Um, in this research, I've actually found some evidence that having prairie nearby and prairie, which is mainly composed of uh, grasses and forbs, um, can be important for predicting pest control. So I think what we need to do is continue to examine the combinations of different types of agriculture surrounded by different types of natural habitat to see what will maximize services by birds in these different contexts. All right, so um, I wanted to just thank all of the farms where I did this research and the people that helped out with that. And I think we maybe have a couple minutes for questions. Yeah, yeah, we definitely do. Thank you so much, Megan. That was really, really great um, and really interesting uh, research. Uh, so thanks for sharing. Uh, if anybody has any questions, please uh, put them in the chat box. I don't see any at this moment, um, but you might want to just check your your chat box, Megan, to see if anybody private messaged or DM'd you there. Um, I have a question for you, Megan. Thank you for that great presentation. Um, uh, it was really interesting to hear Sasha's presentation and then yours and know that Sasha found there was a lot of uh, support of uh, birds by hedgerows, but the pest control was really def uh, defined by those big trees that birds really were attracted to those big trees. Um, not so much the hedgerow, but in your situation where it was interesting to look at the, the um, shrubs were most attractive or most uh, predictive of pest control and not trees. And I was wondering what that was about. And it must be, or I'm asking, it, do you think it's because we, the arboreal birds, the tree loving birds aren't gonna go out there on the, and forage on the ground? Um, it's going to be the robins and, and scrub jays that like shrubs that then are going to be down foraging in those lower crops, in the lower uh, row crops. Yeah, I think that's uh, absolutely going to play a role. And so that was part of the reason why I wanted to do this experiment in the first place was because so much of that research had been done in places that would be, you know, like for instance, coffee farms you might you might expect to find birds there because um, they sort of can replicate the the natural habitat around there. Um, whereas row crops are are pretty different from the surrounding natural habitat. And I, I think we have these different groups of birds. So definitely a, a tree specialist like a woodpecker, um, you're not going to expect to find them down in those row crops. Um, 
but I think things that make use of shrubby habitat um, might be a little more generalist in their, their habitat use. So birds um, like a robin, for instance, um, might be attracted to the shrubs and then um, might also be willing to go forage in a row crop type of habitat as well. Um, whereas a, a woodpecker probably wouldn't be willing to. And I don't know if Sasha has anything to add to that. Um, but yeah, I think the, the different types of agriculture definitely plays a role. Great. Um, someone did have a question about what kind of glue you use to attach the caterpillars to the kale. So <laughs> good question. Um, so it's actually a cyanoacrylate, which is just a super glue type glue, um, which is technically safe for consumption um, by birds. So they, um, any of that glue that they got uh, would be safe for them to consume. Great. Well, I, I don't see any other questions, um, but uh, yeah, so I think I'm gonna move on so we can uh, wrap up with just a, going over a few resources. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen one last time. Great. So um, you all should have received a link to uh, this resource page um, yesterday when we sent out a reminder about this event. Um, but if you didn't, you can access it at that um, URL. And I will, there were a few resources mentioned during this um, talk today to the, during the presentation that I'm gonna add. So I'll, I'll send that, um, this back out one last time with, with those additions as well. Um, and let's see, whoops, sorry, there we go. Um, I also just wanted to mention that we have, um, this is a publication put out by Wild Farm Alliance um, that is a really great resource. You can download it for free from our website um, and it covers research um, and um, science about birds and agriculture and, um, and outlines different practices that farmers can use to attract like hedgerows and, and many, many other practices. Um, that you can use and um, to attract beneficial birds or manage best birds on, on your farm. And uh, the companion, there's an online companion to that guide, um, which is our um, story map um, that you can um, access here at bit.ly at beneficial birds. And um, what's great about this is it has similar information from the booklet, but it also has um, different profiles about farmers um, and different videos, like the one that we saw at the beginning of the presenta presentation today. Um, and so we will be adding more of those videos um, over the next few months as well. So you should check that out. And um, I, those are the resources that I wanted to cover. And so now I'm going to um, run the, the evaluation. And again, it's just 10 questions. It shouldn't take you very long. Um, and um, before I do that though, I just wanna say thank you so much to all the, pre the speakers today. Um, it was a really, really wonderful presentation and I learned a lot and I'm sure that everybody also learned a lot um, listening in. Um, so again, the poll, I'll run the poll and just when you're done answering, just make sure to hit the submit button. Um, you'll be entered into the raffle for the Patagonia shirt. And um, this information is just really helpful for us and also for our funders. So please um, take a few minutes. And then once you're done with that, you can exit. Um, and that's the end of our presentation today. So thanks again.